All right, so for the stuff that we're gonna cover in thermochemistry, I do wanna hit on a lot of these things. Thermochemistry, despite maybe what its name sounds like, is not just about thermal energy, but that is a big part of it because it's the easiest thing to measure. So we can break up energy in general, talking about all different types of energy, a bunch of different ways. The ones that we focus on in this chapter are work and heat, specifically. Work and heat. Energy is like the broadest thing. It, we describe it as a capacity to do work. You expend energy, use up energy to do work. A bunch of different ways that can happen. Acting over distance. Heat, though, is the flow of energy caused by a difference in temperature. So if you have a hot thing that's close to a cold thing or surrounded by cold things, the heat will leave the hot thing and go into the cold things. And a lot of what we do is we exchange energy through contact between two things, mostly, right? Again, calorimetry is the thing that we do the most. Uh, you take something hot and you put it into cold water. You take something cold and you put it into hot water or room temperature water and energy gets exchanged and we can measure temperatures. Really easy to measure temperatures. If you're holding a cup of hot coffee, heat energy gets transferred into your hand because the coffee is hotter than your hand. These are more of the ways that we can break up energy into different types. It's like kinetic energy is motion. If something's moving, it has kinetic energy. If it's not moving, it doesn't. Thermal energy is the energy associated with temperature. So when you're measuring something, you're measuring the thermal energy of that thing. Remember, temperature also tells us the average speed of um, particles in a gas, or particles in anything, really. So thermal energy is actually a form of kinetic energy. It's telling us something about the kinetic energy of the particles in a substance. Potential energy, which we'll mostly talk about in terms of chemical energy, so chemical energy kind of goes under potential energy, is potential energy. So it's the potential to do work of some kind, or the potential to transfer that energy to something else. And then because we live on Earth, um, basically everything's affected by the gravitational field of Earth, meaning it wants to fall towards Earth. So if you hold something up, its position relative to Earth is what gives it gravitational potential energy. Uh, and when you drop it, that gets converted. And then again, chemical energy um, takes place. It has to do with the arrangement of electrons and nuclei around each other. We'll get more into that in like Hess's law and enthalpies of formation. But you can think of like lighters or butane or gasoline, right? Those have chemical potential energy and we use that to heat things up or to drive your car, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so really we're gonna be talking about kinet or thermal energy, which is a kinetic form of kinetic energy, and chemical energy, which is a form of potential energy. And so we'll be doing chemical reactions and releasing that energy as thermal energy and measuring it, or you can do a chemical reaction and absorb thermal energy. Again, all calorimetry. And so really that's the way that we interface with both of these things. We measure the chemical energy of something by reacting it. And when it reacts, it releases or absorbs thermal energy. So we can't really measure the directly the energy of something, we can measure changes. And that's why this law is important for talking about calorimetry, for talking about thermodynamics, because if this was not true, if there was not conservation of energy, then it could be destroyed or it could be lost or it could come from nowhere. Bless you. That even that energy didn't come from nowhere. So energy can be transferred from one thing to another. Usually it gets transferred into multiple things and we ignore most of them and only talk about the larger ones. So like here, you take the gravitational potential energy of a pool ball and you hold it up. When you drop it, that gets converted into kinetic energy. When it hits the table, it then gets converted into thermal energy. So it's never lost. And even as it's falling, it's not all being converted into kinetic energy because there's air and wind resistance. And so that is even being converted into thermal energy. If it bounces, then some of that kinetic energy is being returned from the table. Um, and then it will bounce and any of the energy lost in the bounce is either lost in the deformation of the table or as thermal energy and eventually it all ends up as thermal. So even though sometimes it may seem like we do calorimetry tonight or Wednesday, um, it might seem like we lose energy to nowhere. It's just lost to the surroundings in one form or another. But this always holds true. Law of conservation of energy, that's why it's scientific law. This is really just explaining like how we get these units of energy. So the SI unit of energy is a joule. 
which is actually a really small amount of energy. It's like a 10 watt light bulb, not a very bright light bulb if it's incandescent. It's about an LED light bulb, like the bright ones are like 7.5 watts, I think. In one hour, it uses 36,000 joules. So we could take the unit of joule and actually break it up into more base units. So it's a compound unit. You don't really need to worry about that for this class. We're just gonna talk about energy in terms of joules or kilojoules. So 1,000 joules is one kilojoule. Some other units of energy that you'll see, the calorie is 4.184 joules exactly. That's because the calorie was related to the amount of energy it takes up to heat one gram of water by one degree ski. But that's calorie with a lowercase c. The caloric or the nutritional calorie, like when you eat something and it's got like a granola bar I had today, it was 160 calories. That's capital C, which is a thousand lowercase c's. It's like a kilocalorie, as in lowercase c calorie. So really a 2000 calorie diet, it makes you feel better like you're eating more calories. It's actually a 2 million lowercase c calorie diet. It makes you feel better or worse, I don't know. Maybe if you're bulking. Larger unit, kilowatt hours look like PG&E will use, right? Or now for like electric cars, the battery in the electric cars are measured in kilowatt hours. Some other units. We really do just stick to joules. Although I think the lab manual might use calories sometime, sometimes. Again, so thermodynamics is the study of energy and its interconversion. And specifically here we're talking about thermodynamics and chemistry. The first law of just sort of general thermodynamics is uh, conservation of energy. So energy, the amount of energy in the universe is constant. So we can't produce energy out of nowhere again, and we can't destroy energy. It always goes somewhere. Most of the time it spreads out and is just goes to less useful forms or becomes less concentrated. All right, state functions. There are a lot of things like potential energy, like its name sounds like what it is. It's energy that it has and could potentially provide or use. A state function is not like that. It doesn't really, can't really get what it is from its name. <clears throat> when we talk about state functions, we're talking about specific things where it doesn't matter how you get from A to B, the value is the same. So elevation is a good example of a state function. So if you're hiking, we have path A, it takes 12 miles to get up to the top of this mountain. The elevation change is still 10,000 feet, which is a huge mountain. Um, path B here though is only five miles. You just go straight up the side of the mountain. Still an elevation change, is 10,000 feet. So we talk about state functions, um, energy, and we'll talk about enthalpy is also a state function, temperature is a state function. It doesn't matter how you get there. Meaning, let's say we've got a temperature here. So we're doing like temperature change. Um, we'll say this is T. If I start at the temperature, I don't know, I'll call it 10 degrees C. And then I go up to 20 degrees C. And I go down to 10 degrees C. And then I go up to 30 degrees C. We're talking about change in temperature between the initial and the final. All of these changes in the middle don't really matter. It just matters that we went from 10 up to 30. Of course, most of the time that doesn't happen, but, or I guess I should say probably if we, it would be weird if it went down. So we go 10 to 20 to 25 up to 30, or if we go from 10 up to 25, up to 30, both paths end up being the same change in temperature. And we could relate that to the amount of energy also. So a change in temperature of 20 degrees C is gonna be the same amount of energy. They won't be one to one. So state functions mean, doesn't matter all of the stuff we do in between, just how we get to the end point and the difference from A to B. So you mentioned heat in that first or second slide. Heat is a transfer of energy. So we talk about it being hot outside or if you're gonna heat something up, that means you're gonna to to add energy to it. 
So when we use the word heat, we are using it as this transfer of energy, but I don't think we really think of it that way. But really heat is always a transfer of energy, whether it's transferring energy into something or out of something. So we talk about cooling something off, we're also, I guess we have a transfer of heat, the change in thermal energy. But temperature is how we measure thermal energy, and we can only really measure that as like instantaneous. This is the temperature at this time, this is the temperature at that time. And it gives us an idea of the overall energy of that matter, the thermal energy of that matter. And then heat always flows from high temperature matter to low temperature matter, but only until both objects are the same temperature. So we call that thermal equilibrium. Right, this is why if you, I don't know, if you heat up some soup, you leave it out, if you leave it out for long enough, it will eventually be the same temperature as the room around it. Leave anything out, it'll eventually be the same temperature as the room around it, because it'll either absorb energy from the room or will release energy into the room. It's usually not enough energy to change the temperature of the room. But when we talk about calorimetry and we put something into our calorimeter, or we start a reaction of the calorimeter, that will change the temperature of the water because the water will start absorbing energy from that reaction or from that object um, as the object cools or gives up all of its thermal energy. And then they'll always end up as the same. All right, and when a system absorbs heat, its temperature changes by delta T. Now, the amount of temperature change for the amount of heat is not always the same for different objects. So depending on the substance, it's gonna have something called a heat capacity. So the heat capacity, uh, not specific heat capacity or molar heat capacity, just the heat capacity uh, has units of either joules per degree C or joules per Kelvin. And because we're both, we're using change in temperature here, those numbers should be the same. Joules per degree C or joules per Kelvin. So when I take that joules per degree C, joules per Kelvin, multiply it by a temperature change, tells me the energy. Heat capacity is less useful for most things, because there's another factor here that we have to take into account. If you're heating up a small cup of water, it takes a lot less energy to heat up that cup of water. If you have a lot of water, like a pot of water, it takes more energy to heat up that water, and that fact is not taken into account in this equation. So the amount matters. So that's why we have specific heat capacity. And to make it easier to use, that's per gram of substance. So if I have one gram of water, or if I have a thousand grams of water, now that's factored in here and I can use this to calculate either changes in temperature or changes in energy if I'm measuring the temperature. You can also take this, because if it's for one gram of substance, I could take that one gram and I could convert it into moles. I could calculate molar heat capacity. But again, we can't measure moles directly. We can only measure mass most of the time. So usually spe specific heat capacity is um, what you're given and not molar heat capacity. And then once we take this and we relate it to an amount of the substance, it becomes an intensive property. Or actually, yeah, I guess it is an intensive property whether or not it's in the equation or not. Right. Does anybody remember intensive property, what that means? Yeah, that's that's the kind of idea. The amount of it changes. Yeah, that feels off. I think that's the extensive properties. Extensive is, this is an extensive property. It's just heat capacity because the amount of it changes the amount that it changes. The specific heat capacity doesn't change for the amount that you have. For example, water is always 4.184 joules per gram degree C. That value doesn't change for water. If I remove this grams, yeah, it was on the right track for that. So grams, if I remove grams from this, now it's not related to the amount. And that property would change because if I change the amount, this is only for one gram. And so I can always cancel out those units by multiplying by grams. The intensive property is also like density, grams per milliliter, right? If I change the amount, the density wouldn't change, but I'd have more water, that means more mass. Okay, so we need this because now we've got specific heat capacity, joules per gram degree C, and if we're doing unit analysis, again, you could take something, 
You take something like this and rewrite it as joules over grams degree C. That's what that means. Grams and degree C are on the bottom. So if I take this joules per gram degree C and I multiply it by grams and I multiply it by a change in temperature degree C, the grams and the degree C cancel out and I'm left with just joules. So you can see here, we got a bunch of different values for different things. And remember, the delta here means temperature change. And this is always temperature final minus temperature initial. The order matters because it matters if something is heating up. Yeah, we haven't talked about exothermic or endothermic yet. If this is an exothermic process, or if we've got something that's losing energy, we want this temperature final should be lower than the initial temperature. So the temperature should go down, meaning we lose heat. If something's warming up, then it'll be the opposite. Okay, we're gonna do, I pulled one example off of Alex to do because it looked like a lot of people still need to do that. So when two objects at different temperatures are placed in contact, so for example, putting ice into room temperature water, we got ice, which is zero degrees C and water, which is something like probably 20, 21 degrees C. Heat's gonna flow from the material at the high temperature to the material at lower temperature. So goes from the warm, warmer water into the ice until both materials reach the fi same final temperature. So then we can use that and we can use this fact. If we call uh, one of them the system and one of them surrounding, so in this case, maybe we call the ice the system and we call uh, everything else, the water, the surroundings. We can measure the temperature change in the water, and we could measure the temperature change in the ice potentially, although it wouldn't change until it melts. We can measure the temperature change in the water and figure out how much heat energy is lost by the water, is gained by the water, lost, no, lost by the water, and then gained by the ice. Sorry, I'm a little bit jet lagged. <laughs> I was up for 36 hours. Not last night, I slept last night. I slept very well last night. The night before I was up for 36 hours because we flew back from Japan yesterday. Technically the day before here, sorry. Anyways, the water is losing energy so we'll see its temperature go down. The ice is gaining energy and because it's ice, its temperature actually won't change but we could use the change in temperature of the water to figure out how much energy was absorbed by the ice. Again, remember conservation of energy, we're gonna ignore all of these other places where the energy gets lost to or gained from. But we can basically say if one of the objects in contact with the other object changes temperature, then that energy is being lost or gained by the other object. So we're just taking it from one and putting it in the other or vice versa. All right, so I'll do a quick example of this from one of these Alex problems. All right, so we've got a sample of glass, the specific heat capacity of 0.67 joules per gram degree C, put into a calorimeter, nice little sketch, that has 200 grams of water. Glass sample starts off at 88 degrees C, the temperature of the water starts off at 21 degrees C. When the temperature of the water stops changing, it is 23.8 degrees C. The pressure remains constant at one atmosphere. Okay, this last part is actually important because that tells us that this is a like a coffee cup type calorimeter where pressure is constant, meaning that we can ignore any work being done. Okay, so if the glass sample starts off at 88 degrees C, what's the final temperature of the glass sample? It'll be the same as the water. Because eventually, again, the hot thing's gonna cool off, the cold thing's gonna warm up, but only until they're the same temperature because everything wants to be evened out and spread out. So this actually gives us the final temperature for both. Now, the only thing that we're missing is the mass of the glass sample, which is what it's asking for. So what should we do first? Yeah, calculate delta T. Delta T for what? Yeah, we do need the delta T for both of them. Because ultimately what we're working with here is the thing that I just described where we've got 
Q of surroundings, or I should say Q of the system equals Q, negative Q of the surroundings. And we can calculate Q using Q equals MC delta T. So if I have the mass, heat capacity, and delta T, and here our system's gonna be the uh, glass. I guess I'll just do this. And so I can set that equal to negative mass of water, C of water, and delta T of water. Because we know the specific heat capacity of water, even though it's not given here specifically. That's the kind of thing that I would at least provide on a table for you somewhere. So we know the mass of the water, it's 200 grams of water. We know this specific heat capacity. So if we can calculate the delta T, which we can, we've got the initial and the final temperature of the water. Then we can calculate the energy. Oh, it doesn't really matter where this is, but we can calculate in this case, the energy that's gained by the water. And this will work out nicely because mc delta t should be a negative value because we've got the glass starts hot, ends up cold, so that means it's losing energy. But all of that aside, it ultimately comes down to the math and the change of temperature. This is where, again, final minus initial is important because the final temperature of the water is 23.8 degrees C minus the initial temperature, which is 21.0 degrees C which is gonna give us a positive temperature change. Did the water gain or lose heat? It goes from a low temperature to a high temperature, gained heat. Right? Increases in temperature, it gains heat. All right, so let's see what all that is. Do you remember my calculator? 200, I should say negative 200, times 4.184 times 23.8 minus 21. This is negative 2,343.04 joules. Now in this case, I've already set up this Q of system equals the negative Q of the surroundings. We could have just calculated this value without setting up that equality first, such as the AC, it's loud. Right, so this value is the amount of heat, sorry, it would be positive if we didn't calculate it with this equation, right? If this was just the Q equals MC delta T, it would equal this value positive. Yeah. Is that? It is the AC. The AC is just loud. Okay, very distracting. So this is the amount of heat that was gained by the water. It would be a positive value because this would be positive. This is positive. It would be positive here. But if we're trying to calculate the amount of heat that's lost by this glass, it goes from high temperature down to a low temperature, Q should be negative, which is why we have Q of the system equals negative Q of the surroundings. This, Q, this negative here is really just to flip the sign. Whatever this ends up being, positive or negative, we need to flip that sign because the heat that's gained or lost by the surroundings comes from or goes to the system or vice versa. In this question, we've got to define the water as the surroundings. Yeah. The glass is the system. So in this case, it's the glass that's losing energy, heat energy, thermal energy. It's the water that's gaining it. And so we can plug in the things that we do know about the glass. Uh, which is not M, but we want to find M. And then the change in temperature, which I need more space for. And again, temperature final versus temperature initial. What's the final temperature for the glass? That's the change in temperature. The final temperature, yeah, we need that, and that, that sounds correct. But the final temperature is 23.8. The initial temperature is going to be 88.7. The change in temperature is 26. Sorry, what was it again? Negative 64.9. Okay, so we just need to divide both sides by that, really just divide negative 2,334. 
by 0.67 and negative 64.9. All right, looks like the jet has finally taken off. Um, so M is going to be 53.9 grams. And if you haven't managed your negatives correctly, you'll end up with a negative mass. So in the case of this problem, because we're calculating mass, we could just assume that it's supposed to be positive. If you end up with a negative mass, though, if you haven't done these yet on Alex, you still need to. Maybe I can, like, anyways, you can, you should go back and try and figure out why you got a negative, where you missed, the, where you missed it. If it was here, if it was in switching, your temperature final, temperature initial, because it should work out to be a positive value. Okay. Any questions? Those? No. One thing I do want to mention, which maybe you're familiar with now, maybe not. When something's written like this, joules and it's grams to the negative one, degree C to the negative one, that just means that grams and degree C are in the denominator. So this, again, means joules over grams degree C. Because something to the negative one power is one divided by whatever that is. Okay. So that's specific heat capacity. Maybe I should have this slide before. But so we have a block of metal, 55 degrees C, gets added to water at 25 degrees C. Again, we have a situation where the thing that we're adding to the water is hotter. So because these are different temperatures, thermal energy will transfer from the hot one to the cold one. So we'll expect the temperature of the metal to go down, the temperature of the water to go up, until they're the same temperature. And this does very much matter uh, or depend on the mass of the metal and water and the specific heat capacities, capacities of the metal and water. Really, the only time that you can assume that it ends up exactly in the middle is if I have some, if I have the exact same mass of water, cold water and hot water. If I mix those together, the heat capacity of water is the same, so the temperature will end up in the middle because the masses and heat capacities cancel. Okay. Ah, so enth enthalpy is slightly different from energy. Most of the time, it's very close. Sometimes it's even the same. But when a chemical reaction occurs open to the atmosphere, what we would say is constant pressure, right? If pressure is constant, that means that the volume has to change. Then energy can evolve as both heat and work. Because if we have a change in volume, right? remember one of our definitions for um, work, the definition for work is energy over a distance. Um, so if you're pushing something, you're causing movement, you're converting energy into kinetic energy, um, and you're using that energy up. So if we are expanding whatever reaction it is, occurs, and then expands against the pressure of the atmosphere, that's work. Your gases that you're creating in a chemical reaction are moving the rest of the atmosphere out. And so some energy, when you do a reaction at constant pressure is lost as, or can be lost as work. When we're talking about enthalpy, we're talking about just the internal energy of a system, E, and the product of its pressure and volume. So if the pressure is higher, it's harder to increase the volume. More work has to be done, so you lose more energy. If you increase the volume a lot, even if it's a low pressure, that affects the amount of work that's done. If you have to push four suitcases over a mile, a couple times, a <laughs> couple times, yeah. Uh, public transit's great, except for when it stops. Anyways, I'll tell the story later if you want to hear it. So anyways, here, if we're, again, if you have to move something over a long distance, that's going to be a lot of work. If you have to push something really heavy, that's also going to be a lot of work. So both pressure and volume are related to the amount of work that's being done. So we can boil down that factor product of pressure and volume into work. So when we're doing enthalpy, remember state functions. It doesn't matter how we get to A to, from A to B, just the amount that it changes. Energy, pressure, and volume are all state functions. So pressure change, the only thing that matters is from A to B, not how it gets there. Same with volume and energy. So the enthalpy change of a reaction, so I guess a product of all of these different state functions, 
if I have a change in energy, change in or a, sorry, change in energy, pr constant pressure, and a change in volume, energy is actually also the internal energy and the work. So this external work that gets done on the atmosphere, on the surroundings, it's subtracted out of this total energy to just give me the energy inside of or the internal energy of a reaction. And again, we can only really measure changes here. Bless. So this is why for, so constant pressure, if I do something in a coffee cup calorimeter, it's not a pressure vessel. If I tried to create too much pressure inside of a coffee cup, styrofoam coffee cup, it would explode. There are bomb calorimeters. I don't think we're going to use bomb calorimeters. Bomb calorimeters are called bomb calorimeters because they have a constant volume and the pressure increases. So you do a reaction in them, you create a lot of pressure, but the volume stays constant. This is for coffee cup type. This is what we're going to do tonight or what you do on Wednesday, depending on your lab. So very often these are going to be very close, if not the same, but Constant pressure is where you can measure just delta H. So it will factor out that work because any work that's done goes into the atmosphere rather than being measured. So obviously this is going to be, remember it's pressure and volume. It's the change in volume at constant pressure that matters. So if we have a large change in volume, we're gonna lose more energy to work or more energy will be used as work. I should scribble this out for now. Should have covered it up before. Okay, so lighter is usually fueled by butane. If you have one mole of butane, oh, that's right, this is why I was gonna bring the lightsaber, because it's just a butane torch. I'll show you guys in lab. One mole of butane burns at constant pressure. So constant pressure, this is like constant coffee cup calorimetry type thing. It produces 2,655 kilojoules of heat and does five kilojoules of work. So what are the values of delta H and delta E for the combustion of one mole of butane? So really, I think the question is, how is delta E different from delta H? So in a coffee cup calorimeter type situation, we've got, we're measuring just delta H. So what's the energy that we're not measuring in a coffee cup calorimeter? Not delta E, but it's the work part of delta E. So really energy is the heat and the work. Enthalpy is just the heat. So if we're looking at these options, energy is heat plus work. Entropy is just the heat. So here, 2,655 joules. Now, here's one of those times where wording is important. It says it produces, so it means it's releasing. So that should be a positive or negative value. If it's releasing energy, yeah, it's losing energy. So producing or releasing, it's losing energy. So it's gonna be negative. So, okay, we got three of these that are negative and they're all the same value for delta H. So the only thing we can look at really here is that delta E, all of those are negative. We have one that's subtracted out the five kilojoules of work, or I guess added to, right? This is less. This is just five kilojoules of work or energy. And then this is the work plus the heat. So A, B, or C. It's either A or C, definitely not B. So remember, yeah. Oh, yes. But work is being done, so it's also losing that five kilojoules. So yeah, you're adding these two values together, they're both negative though, because they're both energy lost by the system. So the answer is C. This is the heat portion, 2,655. The five kilojoules is the work portion. When we're measuring energy, we're measuring the heat and the work done together. So we end up with a negative 2,660. Yeah, so this is delta H or really it's Q plus work, and this is 2,000, negative 2,655 plus a negative five. We have both the heat and the work. Nisen roku yaku goju go in Japanese. 
You should don't have to say negative in Japanese. Surprisingly little amount of Japanese that you need in Japan. Turns out to be none. You get around pretty fine. Most places, at least. Don't go to rural Japan. Okay, delta H, delta E, follow the same conventions. If something is exothermic, if a system is exothermic, that means it's losing heat. It means it's losing energy. If it's endothermic, that means it's being absorbed, it's gaining energy, or gaining heat, gaining enthalpy. So if delta H is positive, that's an endothermic reaction because it's going into. Endo means into or inside of. An endoskeleton is what, looking around the room, looks like all of us have endoskeletons. I mean, it'd be cool if somebody had an exoskeleton. Exothermic, though, means it's going out. It'd be an exoskeleton, most insects. So an example of this, there are chemical cold packs that are endothermic. It's actually this, the ammonium nitrate dissolving that creates that endothermic process. Um, but chemical hand warmers, things that are exothermic are generally more common. It's way more common to generate heat than it is to absorb heat. For reasons that you'll learn if you take Chem 2. Okay, so identify each process as endothermic or exothermic. And we'll say that the thing that we're talking about, I guess, A, in an ice cube melting, the ice cube is the system. Yeah, right? How do you make an ice cube melt? Put it in the sun, add heat, hold it in your hand, right? Add heat to it. So that means if an ice cube is melting, it's, is it endothermic or exothermic? Endothermic. endothermic. Sign of delta H would be positive. Because it's gaining heat. Nail polish, polish remover quickly evaporating after it's accidentally spilled on the skin. I'll say nail polish remover here is the system. Is the heat going into the nail polish or out of the nail polish? What does it take to boil water? You have to add heat to it. The reason that a nail polish feels cold on your hand when it's evaporating is because it's taking heat from your hand. So nail polish, if the nail polish is the system, it has to absorb heat from its surroundings in order to evaporate. So it's endothermic. So sign of delta H would be positive. And then gasoline burning, again, gasoline being the system. Yeah. So it's exothermic, so it's negative delta H. So gasoline is giving off that heat energy. So you can almost think about most of these things in terms of your hand. I guess things that you can touch or you can feel, right? Gasoline's burning, you can feel the heat coming off of it. Your hand feels warm because it's absorbing heat from the gasoline. So the gasoline has to be losing heat. If you hold an ice cube in your hand, your hand feels cold because your hand is losing heat and it's going into the ice cube. So in terms of the ice cube, it's endothermic. Same with nail polish remover. Oh yeah, where is the heat going to and where is it coming from? Where is it going to? Cotton Eye Joe, sorry. Exothermic reaction gives us thermal energy. What is the source of that energy? Is it the kinetic energy of the gasoline? We're talking about gasoline, or is it the potential energy? All right, it can't be the kinetic energy because otherwise the temperature would fall. So basically, we'd have to. If it came from the kinetic energy, all of the gasoline particles would have to slow down. That's not happening. It's clearly generating lots of heat. So it's actually coming from the bonds in the chemical itself. And so as that gasoline molecule breaks apart. We generally think about those as being weak bonds that are being broken because it takes energy to break bonds, right? To pull two things apart, that takes energy. When strong bonds are being formed and those molecules snap back together into new arrangements, CO2 and water in the case of gasoline, it releases more energy for those to actually snap back together. And so it's that collision actually of the two or two or more atoms coming together, forming those new bonds and their kinetic energy gets released as thermal energy, just like when you drop a billiard ball on table, it's just that there's trillions of billions of those happening at a time. All these little tiny atoms and molecules snapping together and releasing that excess energy. In an endothermic reaction, it'll be the opposite. So you're breaking strong bonds and you're forming weaker bonds. So it takes a lot of energy to pull things apart. Um, and then when they form the new atoms or molecules, you get weaker bonds from those.
All right, so an endothermic reaction occurs in a flask. What's going to happen to the temperature of the flask? I mean, so my reaction's in there, it's in the flask. Reaction happens, it's endothermic, which way is the heat moving? Yeah, it's being pulled from the surroundings and into the flask, or into the, whatever the reaction occurring is. So that means it has to take energy from its surroundings, which in the case of this can be the heat energy. So the temperature has to fall. Right, and that's why chemical cold packs work. It's an endothermic process. It's not really a chemical reaction, although anyways, debatable. Chemical and endothermic process happens inside that chemical cold pack, and then it takes energy from everything around it. So in this case, actually, if this reaction happens, what's happening to the, where's that energy coming from in the water? Is it coming from potential? Or is it coming from the kinetic energy? I would say in, yeah, it's coming from the kinetic energy. Sorry, no, you said potential, sorry. If the temperature of the water is falling, what does the temperature tell us about the kinetic energy of the water? It's changing and it's less. In this chemical reaction, what's happening is, Things are rearranging and stronger, sorry, weaker bonds are being formed. And so that means that it's taking a lot of energy to break the bonds. You're not getting as much when they snap back together into new bonds. So energy has to come from somewhere. And so actually it's stolen from the kinetic energy of the surroundings and causes them to slow down. And so we read the temperature is falling. Okay, in chemical reactions, the stoichiometry of enthalpy is really just like the rest of the stoichiometry. We just have a new, if you can think of it as like a coefficient for this reaction. These amounts of propane and oxygen react forms this amount of CO2, this amount of water, and this amount of heat. Or I should really say this change in heat. Now for this reaction, it's a combustion reaction. So we're burning something, generally exothermic, and we do have a negative value for delta H, tells us that it's exothermic. So the change in energy is a negative value for this reaction, and it releases this amount of energy. And we can relate this to all of the coefficients in a reaction. So if I said one mole of propane burns C3H8, that means that we would get out 2,044 2, kilojoules of heat. But I could also say five moles of oxygen reacts, or I say three moles of CO2 is produced from this reaction, how much heat is produced? We say, oh, well, three moles, three moles of CO2 was produced. That means that 2,044 kilojoules of heat must have also been produced. So if we like put this into a generalized, not real reactants or products, 2A comes together to AA. Delta H, the reaction is negative 51.0 joules. So what's the heat or heat associated with the reaction of six moles of A? So we can write this just like other stoichiometry problems as six moles of A. Now what's the relationship between A and the amount of heat produced? Or you can think of it as the mole ratio. Yeah, so two moles of A goes on the bottom, pulled straight out of our equation, and then negative 51.0 joules goes on top. So six times negative 51, negative 306 joules. Okay. Mm, yeah. Are all of what equal to each other? Here? Yeah, so it's saying, really what it's saying is two atoms of A makes, in this reaction coming together, would form or release 51 joules of heat. Or if I said one mole of this, or one atom of this is produced, actually it's per mole, so one mole of this is produced, that's 51.0 joules. Yeah, so those are all equal to each other, just like other coefficients in chemical reactions. Any other questions? 
Uh, no, because I didn't divide by two. Thank you. Jet lag, yeah, the jet lag's hitting me. I've been feeling good all day, but it's because it's 9 or 10 a.m. in Japan right now, so it feels like I stayed up all night. And I slept all day yesterday. It's weird. It's 9 a.m. tomorrow in Japan. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to divide by two. Okay, and different chemical reaction, bigger, more complicated chemical reaction, but it's the same idea. These numbers of moles of these compounds are related to this number of joules being produced, or absorbed, depending on the sign, in this case produced. So if I have 155 grams of NH3, I just have to convert it to moles. And this should be 17.04. And then multiply by 906. And that gives me negative 8,000. Oh, I have to do the mole ratio. Yeah, I'm starting to feel it now. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, we're done. <laughs> Whoo, that was a real steep decline. Precipitous. All right, I really wanted to get to Hess's Law and we just like almost got there. Oh no, I mean, it's too late. You already had to do the... It's conceptually is not difficult because again, these are state functions. Or actually, energy is a formation is like the part that I really wanted to get to. Um, if you've got multiple reactions that happen, again, it's a state function. It doesn't matter how many reactions happen. All that matters is the total change. So we can take chemical reactions and add them together, and we just add their enthalpies together too. So usually those are, you'll be given them, or they'll come from a table. Um, because the hardest part is like recombining these. Like if we want to know the delta H of this reaction, and we've got all of these separate reactions. We need to rearrange these and we can flip these reactions. So in the forward direction, this absorbs 182.6 kilojoules of heat. I can say then if the reaction went the other way, then this would just be negative 182.6. So forward or reverse reaction, the sign of delta H changes. But when I add these things together, it's like if I added this second equation to the last one, I've got one mole of oxygen there, one mole of oxygen here, the moles of oxygen would cancel out. So by flipping these and then adding them together, we can end up with uh, this final delta H reaction, which is very similar to redox reactions when you add half reactions together, canceling out things on either side.